All right. You can go ahead and put it up there if you guys unblank. Thanks. Um, so Matt usually starts off with a concept for us to think about, and this is the one I picked for today. He didn't leave me one, so this one's all me, so if you don't like it, you can blame me, not him. Uh, but when we think about hymns, does the origin of a hymn matter to us? Have we got any initial feelings or thoughts on that? I've got a lot of yeah. That I think should matter. One is scripture, the second is art. Yeah. I think that's a good comment. The two sources that do matter is scripture and heart. So if it was written by a Calvinist, but it's scriptural, does it matter to us? Okay. Any other thoughts before I make more? Okay. Does how the hymn is used normally matter to you? Let me give you an example. We, we, you're probably thinking of the same example because we talked about it this morning. Sometimes the way that it's used in the secular world, that to use it in a worship assembly gives us a wrong connotation when we do sing the song. What is it? Joy to the world? Joy to the world. It's a good example of that, right? Christmas time, we hear it on the radio, we hear it with music, we hear it all the time, we hear just musical versions of it. But we do sing it occasionally here. But I don't know about you guys, but there's always a little bit of uncomfortable at the beginning, and then I kind of get past that and, and I move forward. So I do think there is some mattering to this. Um, what's the other one? Joyful, joyful, we adore thee always gets me too, because it's, it's built off of Ode to Joy. And I always have a little stutter with it, because I played that in instruments and all of that, and now I'm going to try to sing. So how a hymn is used, or the music it, as well, does sometimes matter. You guys got any thoughts on this anymore? Well, that's pretty good. I guess the origin doesn't matter. Sometimes I think it's a little bit of how Paul says with meat, just don't ask. I don't know the origin of this song, so I can sing whatever I want. Ben? May have already covered this. Sorry, it's a couple minutes late getting in here. But, uh, cover it again. So, what I was going to say is, is so many of the songs that we have um, in our hymnals were written by people who we would not consider members of the church. I mean, you know, Christendom would call them Christians, but Methodists or Baptists or Presbyterians or whatever, hardly any of the hymns in our books were written by members of the church, actual Christians. Yeah. So, I mean, if that's the case, we have to throw out a bunch of a bunch of things. Um, if it's scriptural, if it doesn't, you know, contradict any biblical teaching, then you know what it means when we sing it can be perfectly fine. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. They're along the same lines as commentaries. Mm -hmm. Very few commentaries we would be called written by by what we would call Christians. Yeah. They're written by Calvinists or by uh, Baptists or by Lutherans. But yet we still can believe information from them. We're on guard because not all that information is going to be scriptural information. Yeah. But when you look at a hymn, because it's much shorter, you can you can find the scriptural information much faster and whether or not it's a scriptural song or not. Yeah. And really I think kind of piggybacking off of that, that's one of the advantages we have of using the overhead for most of our singing, uh, is that when we do find a scriptural song with an unscriptural section, we change it. Like, I don't know how many times you guys have noticed there's a different font for a few words there. Well, that's why, is, is we've, we've corrected what would have been incorrect in a song that is by and large entirely correct, and so we can still sing it. All right, open up to lesson five. Let's talk about it for a little bit. Lesson five has two hymns for us to consider once again. So we're going to look at the first one here, and I'll put it up on the screen and have somebody read it as we go along. Which way do I have to point this thing? There we go. As long as you are glorified. Let me get a volunteer to read. I see a lot of hands going like this, or like this. 
but nobody goes like this. Let me get a volunteer. It's not that long. Yeah. Shall I take you from my hand your blessings, yet not welcome me in pain? Shall I thank you for days of sunshine, yet crumble in the days of rain? Shall I love you in the days of pain, and then leave you in the days of drought? Shall I love you when I reap the harvest, but when winter blows, uh, wind blows, then doubt? Oh, let your will be known in me, and your love I will abide. Oh, I love for nothing else as long as you're glorified. Are you good only when I prosper, and true only when I'm filled? Are you king only when I'm carefree, and God only when I'm well? Are you good when I am poor and needy? Are you true when I'm preached and bride, perch and bride? I still regain in the deepest valley, and you're still God in the darkest eye. Thank you very much. Let's read the second one as well. Go back. Your love is extravagant. Let me have a volunteer for that. So which one do you guys want to talk about first? Is there a better? I know it's obvious, but somebody go ahead and be obvious. Thanks, Ben. The second one is much worse, <laughs> but it it's, it's at least mentions Christ, some spiritual aspects of things compared to some of the other ones that we've something you know looked at that, that had no scriptural reference at all yeah outside of the mentions of Christ however it's a train wreck it's it's kind of um, all over the place and it doesn't feel like I'm speaking to my sovereign Lord yeah it doesn't feel like I'm speaking to deity it feels like I'm speaking to a friend or a lover it's 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 weird <clears throat> The other one's much better. The other one's much better. Well, let's, let's stick with this one since we're already here. So we've got some, it does mention Christ. I'm really glad that you, you, you started off with the positives because we don't get to have many positives for Matt's less good ones. Um, but it does. Spread wide in the arms of Christ is the love that covers sin. That's a great line. Like the whole scriptural concept of like a mother hen and the wings that are out. Like you can see that in that line. Um, even the next line, no greater love have I ever known, you considered me a friend, it's not bad. Uh, I'm not sure I would necessarily say friend, but it, it, it's perfectly scriptural. Um, it's just personal preference out of me. Even the idea of capture my heart again is not altogether unscriptural. We think of like uh, in the beginning of Revelation, you know, you need to return to your first love. So we, we can see some scriptural. So right there, smack dab in the middle, it's not bad. Well, let's talk about that first verse section. What do you guys think about the line, your love is extravagant? Yeah. Well, I, I struggle with the word extravagant, don't you guys? I, I don't know that extravagant necessarily is a positive. That your love is extravagant, meaning your love is expensive. Yeah. Your love is pricely. Over the top, Over even. The top. Yeah. You know, this is that weekend you've been saving for for an entire year for two nights in a hotel that you can't afford. That's extravagant. You can go to the Motel 6 three or four times a year for the same price. Uh, that, that's what it sounds like to me. Your love is over the top. Your love is, is difficult. Your love is pricey. Even the idea of, I don't know about you guys, but going to somewhere that I would consider extravagant, your love is uncomfortable. You guys ever gone to a restaurant and you felt really uncomfortable in it? Because this is not my style. <laughs> 
Chili's is the top for me. I get above that and I get real uncomfortable, right? What about the next line? Your friendship, it is intimate. Yes. So I think there's a language problem here. Uh, friends being intimate with each other is not a big deal. Like that, that happens all the time. But in 2021, if I say two people are intimate, we're not thinking of friendship relationship in our mind. Uh, we're thinking lovers. We're thinking married individuals. We're thinking, let's go back to our normal example. They're teenagers, right? That's what comes to mind. Any other thoughts on the first two lines before we get to the, 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 the third? I feel like moving to the rhythm of your grace. <laughs> okay, I love that you started at the back part. I didn't get past the first part. <laughs> yeah. Grace is a gift. Uh, grace is a blessing. Grace is a musical number. I don't. I don't get as much. Like a Baptist church, where they feel the Holy <coughs> Spirit, you know, quote unquote, the Holy Spirit take them over, and then they start dancing in the pews and yelling out. That's that's the image that line gives me. Very true. Very true. More of a charismatic. Yeah. Do you have a thought? Okay. I'm seeing a lot of movement, so I just want to make sure I don't miss anybody. You guys want to guess where this song is most popular? It's already been said. It's in a Baptist church. Uh, they love it. They sing it all the time, especially if they have a band. This is an incredibly popular song for them. And I think that's why. Like, you, you hit it right on the head. Uh, it describes how they're worshiping. Uh, I feel God close to me. I feel Jesus close to me. Uh, it's beyond my norm. And it causes me to move. You can see it. I didn't do that. <laughs> They'll figure it out. We move down to the next line there. Um, your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place. Oh, you had a comment now, yes. This reminds me of Song of Solomon. Mm-hmm. Goes back to the idea of Song of Solomon being an allegory for Christ and the church, right? That that lover relationship, which I think if you listen to Matt and Clay show the last few months, and when they went through Song of Solomon, you're going to realize that's probably not a correct way of understanding it, but it totally does. Yeah. Let's look at that next line. Your fragrance is intoxicating in our secret place. Thoughts? It sounds real weird. I'm a little uncomfortable by it. First of all, where is our secret place? Wherever grace has rhythm, I guess. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I'm just not even sure what to say about it. Like, <laughs> it's uncomfortable. I know where our minds are, but I'm trying not to go there. Yes? Um, but, um, you know, it reminds me of, and he walks with me and he talks with me. I've never, ever been a fan of that song. Um, I understand the meaning behind it, you know, the Garden of Gethsemane and all that. I do understand that, but I, and I understand the relationship with the apostles, and yeah. especially, you know, his cough, really great bond with John. But this reminds me of that song, <laughs> which I, once again, don't think... Yeah, it's another song that's high and emotional. Uh, it's very personal. Intimate is probably a good description for it. Yeah? Any thoughts? Yeah. I look at it in the same way that it talks about with the sacrifices that they are a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord whenever you send up your sacrifice. For us, our worship is a sweet smelling aroma to Him. So I can kind of see how they're getting that concept 
with the idea of your fragrance as intoxicating. But in our secret place, that like when they're saying that when you pray, you're supposed to go into a closet and you're not supposed to do it out on the streets and you're not supposed to do it openly. Is that yep. where they're going with that? I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting way to look at it because on the one hand you have the public fragrance that's supposed to be appeasing to the Lord, but then you have the idea of the secret place where you're supposed to be, you know, praying in secret and not be showy about it. So it's an odd, it's odd to mix those together. It is odd, yeah. And even the idea, like, you're picking up on that fragrance is intoxicating, and our worship is fragrant. Uh, the sacrifice of the Old Testament were a sweet-smelling aroma. We're still a sweet-smelling aroma. The prayers of the saints going up in Revelation are described as an incense. But when we talk about the other direction, because notice it's your fragrance is intoxicating, not ours. What smells does God usually send down in Scripture? There are a few. One main one that, that I'm really looking for. Smoke. Smoke is all over the place. Read the major and the minor prophets. When God is sending a smell down, it is a smoke smell. Anybody find smoke particularly intoxicating? Is that a great smelling fragrance? Anybody ever describe smoke? Oh, that smoke is very, it's a wonderful fragrance. I wish I could have it as a perfume. We just, that's not what we do. Uh, it's choking. Uh, it's difficult. It makes it hard to breathe. That's why God uses smoke. Like, that's what he's doing to his people. I just don't know that God's fragrance is intoxicating. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Talking a lot, but even the idea of intoxicating is not something that's spoken of in positive terms anywhere in the scripture. Or even in you know normal life, the idea of being intoxicated by something is not a positive thing. It's not something that you desire, something yeah. you want. The only one time I could think of in Scripture where intoxicating, where the concept is positive, when it talks about, Paul says, don't be drunk with dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. You know, he's making a one-to-one -one comparison there of intoxication, but he uses the word filled. He doesn't say, don't be drunk with dissipation, be drunk with the Spirit. He doesn't use the same words. And so even there, he changes it to be more positive. All right, any other comments on this song? Because we've talked about the positives here. Spread wide in the arms of Christ is the love that covers sin. No greater love have I ever known. You've considered me a friend. Capture my heart again. Yeah. Capture my heart again. And to me, it's just almost like lighting a fire. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good connection. And I think that's what it's trying to get across. Uh, I may have faded. Stimulate me again. Bring me back. Yeah. Give me more zeal. Give me more love. Give me more encouragement. Give me more opportunities of growth. Yeah. That's why I like those three lines. They're pretty good. Yeah. I'm going to talk again. <laughs> See, I don't care for the phrase capture my heart again because it gives the idea that you're not seeking God. You're wanting him to capture you. You're wanting him to seek you rather than you seeking him. So it, once again, it gives a slight negative spin to it that the idea of capture my heart again, you're actively running away from him and you want him to capture you. You want him to catch you. And that kind of, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way. And that concept has been very popular in a lot of our songs that we've looked through this, in, in this, this class material. Uh, of waiting for the pursuit, that uh, I'm over here and wanting God to come to me. Uh, we've seen that quite a few times through the songs that we decided were less good. Yeah. God's coming to us. We're the ones who are supposed to go to him. Yeah, yeah, he did all his work and then he waited. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this song? So it's less good. I think we've, we've all agreed. 
some of you will go so far as to say bad, but I'm going to say less good because that's what Matt wants. So we go back to the other one. As long as you are glorified. I'm going to assume, people assume that this is the better one, right? They're not both less good. Okay. Uh, this is another pretty interesting one. It's very new, 2008. Uh, it's not very old. Uh, and yet I think its words are kind of old. Uh, they're not typical for newly written songs. I mean, you talk about newly written songs, they're a lot like Your Love is Extravagant. They're peppy, they're upbeat, they're uh, love-filled, they're emotion-filled, uh, they're God come to me and fill me filled. This one's a little different, isn't it? Just to remind us, verse 1, Shall I take your, from your hand your blessings, yet not welcome any pain? Shall I thank you for your days of sunshine, yet grumble in the rain? Interesting lines, right? What are your thoughts? Yeah. We don't want the testing and the trials because nobody likes to be tested. But in order to prove true, we must be tested. Yeah. So it brings to mind the idea that we have to consider God even in those periods of testing. Any other thoughts? But fair weather Christian. Yeah. It, this is what this song's asking. Are you a fair weather Christian? Are you only serving God when it's to your benefit and not his? Yeah. Do you guys can you think of individuals or groups of individuals in scripture that we would call fair weather God following people? Ben? Go somewhere else. I'll come back. Make you think. Of it. I mean, the whole song makes me think of Job and yeah. Job's perspective on things once he reconciles everything in his mind after he's gone through all the turmoil and everything. Um, you know, basically, he comes to the conclusion, you know, that he's he's going to bless God. God gives, He takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Yeah. And that's that's what the whole song makes me think of is, is that kind of perspective that I am God's servant. God can choose what He wills to do with me. Um, he blesses me. Sometimes things don't go my way, but either way, it needs to be all to God's glory. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I saw it as a good contrast for us with the children of Israel. That as they wandered through the wilderness, when God was giving them things, they were happy, but then the very next day they would grumble against him because they were mad about, well, now there's no water, or now there's no food, or we're still wandering the wilderness, and Moses is going to kill us out here in the wilderness. So it's a good, I feel like this song is kind of contrasting that idea that we're looking back at that, and we're saying, can we just take the blessings and not take the bad days? I mean, we need... It rains on the righteous and the unrighteous, so yeah. we can't just take blessings and expect to be okay. Yeah. And yeah, these lines especially reminded me of Children of Israel. The whole, really, if you look through some of the Psalms or you look through some of the minor prophets, uh, the concept of, we are still worshiping you, God, why isn't it better? Uh, it's all over the place. Uh, we're still doing our sacrifices. The temple's still getting its tithes. We're still coming together for our main feasts. Like, we're doing our part, God. Why aren't you doing your part? Uh, why aren't things getting any better? And so that faith begins to slip. They be, the anger with God comes in. Uh, we, we, we don't understand any longer. Or even the wandering years or the judges period. Uh, the judges period is a great example of the, I'll take the blessings, but when it gets bad, I, I, we're, we're just going to go off and not follow you anymore. Any other comments? Okay. The next lines are, shall I love you in times of plenty, then leave you in days of drought? Shall I trust when, a, when I reap a harvest, but when winter winds blow, then doubt? Uh, it goes right along the same lines, right? We're comparing things. We've got the positives, we've got the negatives. What am I supposed to do about it? I was really reminded a lot of, of Paul's comments, or his life, let's just be honest. It's his whole life. Um, even the ideas of, he, before he was a Christian, he followed God, 
then he stopped following God because God shifted and he didn't. He didn't stay with him. But then he became a Christian and he's got high days and he's got low days and he's got days when he has great successes and he's got days when he has great failures. Uh, and I'm reminded of Philippians uh, chapter 1. And I'll go ahead and turn over there. You guys are welcome to as well. Uh, Philippians 1. And some of his comments here, when, when he's being a little bit introspective and he's looking at his life and he's looking at the things that are going on. Philippians 1, uh, we'll look at 12 to 15. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So we've got the same situations, right? Shall I take from your hand the blessings and yet not welcome the pain? We could use Paul's idea. Shall I take from your hand my freedom and not yet not welcome the jail time? And yet he can still find positives out of his jail time. We had a lesson just a little bit ago about Paul and Silas singing in prison, right? Well, that's why. He can find his positives. He can find his benefits. Here he says, the whole imperial guard has been taught. I mean, can you just imagine you're sitting in jail and the guard shift comes in and so you just repeat your sermon. Uh, and then the next guard shift comes in and you repeat your sermon again until you've, you've taught everybody. And even members of the imperial guard believe as a result of it. We've got Christians on the outside that are becoming more confident because Paul didn't lose his confidence. So we can see that uh, if you stay with them, with God, even in those negative periods of time, it can sometimes have a greater impact than just staying with God during the positive periods of time. Yeah. It's almost like the opposite of the way that people think today. That, you know, whenever they're having the blessings, they're not thinking about God. They're not thinking that they, they, think, that they think they don't need God because my life is going well, my life is great, what need do I have of God? But then when the pain comes, then all of a sudden they flock to the churches and they're seeking it, you know, God and they're wanting to know why is this happening to me? But as soon as things get better, what happens? They leave the church again because, well, thanks God, you did what I needed you to do. Now you can go back in your box and I'm gonna go back and live my life yeah. until the next hardship. <laughs> And when that hardship hits, all, all of a sudden, the church is filled again with people who are seeking the Lord. You know, a good example being 9-11, that churches were filled for months after that happened. But then what happened? They slowly dwindled away until yeah. all that was left was whatever group had, was originally meeting there. Yeah, the group that took the blessings and the pain. Yeah. Uh, I was reminded a lot of David as well. David's a great example in Scripture of somebody who just trusts in God. And so I had three primary examples when we can see through First and Second Samuel that David, uh, in his negative time, stays with the positive. So when he's chased by Saul, like in First Samuel 24, uh, he gets in there and he's ready to kill Saul in that cave. Uh, and he has this, this moment of, I can't kill God's anointed. So he's in this low point of his life and yet he still stops and he says, wait, I got to stay with God. I can't just let it go. Or at the death of his son, 2 Samuel 12. Uh, he sinned. His son is paying the price for it. He goes in the temple for the eight or so days when his son is ill until he dies. He lies prostrate before the Lord. Well, he goes to the tabernacle, not the temple. But anyways, uh, and then he gets himself up. He cleans himself up and he goes on. He stayed with God through the pain. And then afterwards, he's continued to stay with God. Or driven out by Absalom. I want to talk about some infuriating chapters. Uh, read that story, that interchange, when Absalom is trying to usurp the throne. And the people coming to him and saying, David, you've you got to get more involved here. You've got to get more angry at him. You've got you to lead us. And he just stays back and he says, it's, it's my fault. I just need to stay with God. And, and, and he really struggles during that time period. Any other thoughts anybody has? Okay, let's look at the chorus. 
O oh, let your, your will be done in me, in your love I will abide. O oh, I long for nothing else as long as you are glorified. What are your thoughts on the chorus? Paul's perspective in the chorus that to live is for the Lord and to die is gain that that kind of mentality that as long as he is alive he's glorifying God he's yeah. working for God I think these lines for me are especially convicting because um, I don't know about you but there's things in life that are nice right we like living here uh, when people are ill or they're getting you know, close to death or they have the potential of death, we get real scared. We, we, we think about the things we still want to do. Uh, family members are upset by it. Even though if you're a faithful Christian, look, kicking the bucket's a better option. Um, we don't think that way. But that is the way this chorus is trying to get us to think. Uh, there's wonderful stuff on this earth, but my primary concern is whether or not God is glorified. Not whether or not I got to see the thing or do the thing, or talk to the person, is he glorified? And that's convicting. Because let's be honest, we get real wrapped up in our lives. Uh, and, and yes, on Sundays, and probably on Wednesdays, we are thinking of God. And we're probably very concerned with, is he glorified on these days? But on a Tuesday, or a Friday, we, we don't often stop and think, am I glorifying God? Or am I working to have him be glorified? Or am I working to have his love continue to abide in me? Am I working to have his will being done in me? And that may involve changing our lives to find those opportunities, because you can live your life in such a way that really Monday through Saturday, there's not really a lot of opportunity for God's will to be done in us, because we just aren't around that. We don't put ourselves out in those positions. So this song's pretty convicting to me. Any other thoughts on the chorus before we look at verse 2? Ben? Absolutely right in the, in the idea of conviction here because I really feel like if a lot of people are honest with themselves, this is a very hard chorus to sing truthfully. Um, and it's a very un American idea for sure. Um, and it's, I mean, it's a very Christian idea being Christ like and, and, you know, and, and basically just accepting God's will as what you need to be doing, what you need to be involved in, and what your entire purpose is. But that, like you said, that's very, very hard to do, especially um, living in a society that is very me-focused. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's an extremely unselfish perspective. I think it's a the, the idea, the concept of uh, essentially just letting go of control and, and yielding your will and your life to God. And that's what we need to do. But I also think that it's a very difficult thing for us to do. Yeah. Even I think Paul touches on this when he talks about uh, to the unmarried individuals. What is that? Romans or Corinthians? One of those. Um, and he, he, his point to them is don't get married. Because if you're married, you have to be concerned about worldly things. Uh, the husband cannot just simply devote himself 100% of the time to, to working for Christ. And if he eats, he eats. If he doesn't eat, he doesn't eat. If he hasn't worked in six months and he lives just off of whatever pebbles on the ground he can shove down his gullet, then that's enough. That's Paul, right? But if you're married, you have to take care of your spouse. It, it's scriptural, right? We're required to do so, which means I have to divide my time now. And this song gets at that. Making sure that when we divide our time, we're dividing it fairly. That we're not saying, I can give 10% to God and 90% to my spouse or to my kids. Because once you add kids in there, you've got even more that you've got to deal with, right? You have to take these children from nothing to making them into an adult that will someday be able to sing this song and be concerned about whether or not they're glorifying God. Like, that's the goal. That's a lot of effort. But you also have to stop and think, what am I doing to continue to make God be glorified? Because you can raise your kids in such a way that is not concerned with whether or not God is being glorified. And you can raise your kids in such a way that is very concerned with whether God is being glorified. So consider these things is what this song is wanting us to do. To examine our lives in the brief moments of singing this chorus especially. 
and decide, do I really want his will to be done in me or do I want his will to be done in me later? Well, we can't just put it off till later. Any other thoughts before we hit verse 2? With all of that, this psalm is hitting on two very strong purposes for singing, glorifying God and teaching and admonishing. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, it is probably one of the most convicting songs that, that I've read, especially in, in this you know, class material, but really just in life. I feel like we need to add this. This needs to be a song that is sung. Yeah. Our theme for this year, Be the Light. Yeah. Because uh, that's what it's saying. You've got to be the light. And you have to be intentional about being the light. You can't just be a reflective surface off on the side, but this is intentionality in this song. Let's look at verse 2. I like the words of verse 2 arguably better than I like the words of verse 1. Um, are you good only when I prosper and true only when I'm filled? Are you king only when I'm carefree and God only when I'm well? What do you guys think about those four lines? Point eyes. Yes. It does hit a lot of us right between the eyes. I love the use of the word only. Are you good only? King only? True only? God only? Well, it gives us an obvious answer, doesn't it? Nobody at the end of, are you good only when I prosper, has to stop and think, well, let's think about this for just a moment. No, it leaves us with no misunderstanding. The answer is obviously, no, you're not good only when I prosper. We can all get there. So when we're singing this song, it doesn't take a whole lot of thought to know exactly what this song's wanting us to think. Any other thoughts? Yes. I think it kind of hints to um, our uh, inner self always thinking we can set the conditions and we can't. Yeah. In our relationship with God, we do, cannot set the conditions for his love to us or our love to him. He's, in, like Ben said, he's the one in control. So that's, as Americans especially, we yeah. feel like we have all these rights to have input in things that we are asked to do or told to do. And, and it's just not the case. And we really, that's, a humbleness that's hard for a lot of people to get yeah. to. I think you're the second person, or maybe even the third on this song that's hit on, this is an un-American song. Like, it, it's not really how we're raised, it's not how we're taught, it's not how the world works here, it's how God wants us to work. Um, when you were talking, it brought me to mind of marriage vows, traditional marriage vows, when we say, in sickness and in health, for better or for worse, well, where in those, you know, two lines do we have, you know, a way out for divorce? Like, <laughs> it's just not there. And yet the American response is, oh, it's getting really hard. I don't really like you anymore. I would classify that as worse, correct? So when we look at this song, that's what it's asking us. We've made a commitment to God in sickness and in health and for better or for worse. So if my life is as worse as it's going to get... I made an agreement that he is still good. I made an agreement with him that he is still true, he is still king, he is still God, even when it is worse, and also when it is better. Any other thoughts? Yeah. yeah to back to, I don't know if you or Ben mentioned it, Joe, that you can see these are questions he asked that, you know, should I only prosper when you prosper for me yeah. or you know are you only there for me in these times of plenty or are you there constantly are you always there for me even in these times of, of struggle that I'm going through you know everything that he went through and he never cursed God yeah. but did question him he did ask yes and all four of his friends made the point God only prospers you when you're faithful. That's their perspective. And so this song challenges that. And so does Job. You know, he, that's his challenge. Uh, does God 
Is God only good when, I'm pros- when I prosper? Is God only true when I'm filled? Or is he still good and true even when I'm sitting in a pile of ashes and scraping my boils with a pot shirt? Like, is he still? Uh, the friends would have said, no. You have sinned. God has abandoned you. This song says God hasn't abandoned you. And you may not have sinned. You might have. Like, I'm not going to leave that door entirely shut. But God has not abandoned. Let's look at the last four lines here. You are good when I'm poor and needy. You are true when I'm parched and dry. You still reign in the deepest valley. You are still God in the darkest night. What a great four lines of summary uh, for everything that we have been feeling through this song, everything that we've been thinking through this song. He comes down to, this is the conclusion. I find you to be good all the time. I find you to be true all the time. I find you to still be king all the time. I find you to still be God all the time. Any other thoughts you guys have on this section? Yeah. This is the section where we will falter. This is the section where you're being tested. And this is the section where you have to stand up for God. Because we've all had dark days. We've all been down in the valley and waiting to come back up. God doesn't say we won't be tested. He says you will be tested and be prepared for it. And when you're not being tested, be grateful for that little break in life because you're about to be tested again. Yeah. Uh, the cyclical nature of testing, I think, is what you're getting at there. And, and I think it's true. Uh, David's life definitely was very cyclical. Uh, even the children of Israel's existence with God is very cyclical between their ups and their downs, and their up and their down, and their up and their down, and, and we're only through Joshua. <laughs> and they keep going up and down. Yeah. I see a lot of the uh, book of Ecclesiastes in this, that he goes through so many, talking about so many different topics and talking about God in so many different ways. And then when you get to the end, he says, the end of it is this, that, you know, worship God. Yeah. Love the wife of your youth. Go to work. Live your life. It just, it's just as simple as that. It says, trust God, and you'll be fine. Yeah. Yes. Another thing, this whole concept makes me think of it in the title, as long as you're glorified. How many of us are thanking God for blessings that we received six months ago, let alone five years ago? And when should Thanksgiving quit? And, you know, I ask and I ask and I ask and I'm blessed and I'm blessed. And how often do I continue the Thanksgiving? Which, you know, we read in 2 Corinthians, for instance, 8 and 9. That's the whole game. Yeah. We continually be thankful. I think you're right. Bringing things, being thankfulness into this conversation um, kind of flips the whole song on its head. Uh, I remember you during pain. Should I not also welcome you during blessings? You know, should I not also be considering you during periods of sunshine or periods of plenty, uh, but rather than just enjoying the good uh, and forgetting about you? Yeah. Ben. The last section of verse 2 makes me think a lot of um, Psalm 23, honestly, where David is writing to God and doing, you are good when I'm poor and needy, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, um, you are true when I'm parched and dry, you know, he's, he's leading him beside quiet waters, making him lie down in the green pastures, um, you know, and though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear none evil. You, know, you are still reigning in the deepest valley. You're still God in the darkest night. It just makes me think of that whole serene picture of comfort and care and God always being there for you and you needing nothing else that um, David paints for us in Psalm 23. God, yeah, you're exactly right. That put me to mind of... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which I think is what this song needed at the end, is when they're standing there and Nebuchadnezzar says, you're going to go into the fire, and they say, our God can save us, or if he doesn't, he's still God. Live or die makes no difference whatsoever to whether or not God is God. 
Uh, and that's the song's conclusion. We're, we're, we're always, always needing to glorify. Any other thoughts? Yeah. I get the impression, you know, that are we selfish enough to think that only God is with us when things are good? Because I'm so wonderful myself, God should only bless me, and I should never have any dark days. And if I do have dark days, God is not real. Yeah. And that's the mentality of our society today. It's a lot of people. You talk to them and, well, what about that earthquake? Where was God? He's still there. Yeah. Society be like it is today. Therefore, there must be no God if, he, if, he, if we let our society become what it is today. Yeah. So once again, God is God. Yeah. Usually death brings us to that conclusion. My loved one died. Massive amounts of people have died. An atrocity has occurred and many have died. Where's God? That's what drives us down and away. Any other thoughts anybody has? All right, we're going to end about four or so minutes early. So if you got kids back there, they still got four minutes. Um, I'm glad we did not make it to lesson six because I really want Matt to teach lesson six because I don't know what in the world I would have said off of lesson six. So if you guys want to look ahead, you'll know exactly why. Uh, but we'll go ahead and be dismissed.